tremendous honor to be standing here, um, especially considering that it's a memorial lecture in, in, in honor of my father. I remember the first lecture that the MSA hosted, uh, and it's been remarkable that it's gone on for so long and continues to thrive. I thank the MSA, the Malaysian Scientific Association, uh, Uncle Chandran, Dr. Mai Chandran, Dr. Mohinda, who have all known me since I was basically born. I'm not saying they're old, I'm just slightly younger. But uh, it's been tremendous to be part of this. Um, some people ask me, how can we all, how can we offer support? Because I'm not supporting the chair, the person of the foundation is sitting at the table, my wife. I just um, you know, take the glory off her. But it's been hard since my sister is on the organizing committee as well. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it just feels wonderful to be there. Let me just say a few words about my father, uh, because he's been such a tremendous, a tremendous figure in many people's lives, but specifically mine. Uh, I am where I am now because of him. I am who I am now because of him. Um, despite my many mistakes in life, I have always tried to try to live up to what he believed in. Here's a man who is a nation builder, who is a scientist, a global scientist, a global Malaysian, a towering figure. He was the first Asian head of the RRI, the first Asian head of the Malaysian Rubber and Research Development Board that became the Malaysian Rubber Board, the founder and chairman of the Palmer Research Institute and all the ancillary units of that that became the Malaysian Palmer Board, the founder of Malaysian Carbon, the founder of the Malaysian Rubber Development Corporation, the founder of RISDA, the Rubber Industry Small Holders Development Authority, um, the founder of the Institute of Chemistry in Malaysia. Um, I, mean, I could go on and on and on. And at his peak, he was, he had oversight over two industries that controlled over 70% of Malaysia's GDP. One man. And when he retired, he retired on his pension. I remember having a very small amount of money in his bank account and just carrying on and doing whatever he thought was important. And I remember asking him, because, you know, I'm not my father, and I said, Dad, aren't you angry, Dad? Look at all these other people that are retired and they're living in these big bungalows and big cars and they have all these big jobs and millions of dollars and, you know, you're living on your pension and you're, you're I mean, aren't you upset after everything you've done? And his, he, he looked at me shocked and said, I was made a tantri. I have my pension, I did my job. What else am I supposed to expect to get? And that was him, because to him, that was all there was. He was a scientist, he was a nation builder. He did what he thought was important for his country, and when he retired, he retired. And he thought, as far as he was concerned, he got exactly what he signed up for, his pension, the respect, his integrity, and he went on. There are not many people left like him. And he looked at science and technology as the future for everything for Malaysia. He thought that is where we have to grow. Innovation, research. And research includes failure. Without failure, there is no innovation. We cannot be scared of failure. We cannot be afraid of taking chances. Governments, all governments in this country, whether it's the current one, whether it's the previous one, whatever, have to somehow ensure that innovation and research continues. Chances are taken, because from there we progress. From there, Malaysia can be a leading light again in research and development. We were once, we definitely can be again. And I hope that happens. I remember, and, and I saw a quote up here. I remember um, someone telling me about, it has been quoted very often, uh, and it was a plantation union's uh, head, arguing with my father, and he always argued with my dad. I remember those arguments even in the house. Um, you know, unions always took care of the workers, and my father had to try to take care of both the plantation industry uh, stakeholders as well as the uh, as estate workers. And one of those statements that was told to me was that, you know, when they were arguing, my father finally said, you take care of the person under the tree, I will take care of the tree. But remember, if there is no tree, there will be no person under the tree. And the head of the union said, this is after my father's death. In the end, Tan Sri B.C. Shekhar ended up taking care of both. 
We need more of him. I know it's a bit strange coming from a son, obviously, I have best interest, but we need more of him. We need more nation builders. We need more scientists. We need more researchers. We need our young to know that there is a future in being part of research, innovation, and development. And I hope organizations like the Malaysian Scientific Association will do just that. On our part, we want to play a role. So I'm happy to make uh, a couple of announcements today on behalf of the foundation. First, we would like, with the Malaysian Scientific Association, arrange and provide an award in my father's name, half a million ringgit a year, going to a scientist that will create and develop innovation, technology, that can make a difference in society. I will work on being the MSA, but that is what we will do. And because it is a yearly award, I would like to ask the MSA to now change the twice, every twice, uh, two, uh, lecture every twice, two times a year, to an annual lecture, so that the prize can be given annually at your event uh, to a deserving scientist or technologist that creates impact. A Malaysian. Again, thank you very much for allowing us the honor and privilege to sponsor this event. Um, I am so proud to be here um, because this is what my father loved. All of you, what my father loved. What you all do um, is what my father stood up for. And I hope I can play whatever small role to keep it, keep the flame flying and glowing for as long as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Vinod Shekhar, for those kind words and that tremendous announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest of honor really needs no introduction. He was our former Deputy Prime Minister. He's currently leader of the opposition. And tonight, at the cusp of Malaysia's 15th general elections, many believe he's poised to lead Pakatan Harapan to victory and become the 10th Prime Minister of Malaysia. It gives me great honor to invite our guest of honor, Yang Perhormat Tatusri Anwar Ibrahim, to say a few words. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to thank the Malaysian Science Association for inviting me to be with you today. I'm also honored to be included in the annual celebration of the life and the legacy of Dr. D.C. Sekha, who was a great friend and an exemplar of Malaysian whose creativity, passion, for discovery and love of country <coughs> remain an example for all of us mm -hmm. until today. We live in a world where stereotypes left unchallenged often lead to incorrect conclusions. 
At times, these misleading judgments can be harmless, but they can be just as easily be catastrophic to ourselves, to our work, and to entire societies. Politicians, and that does not include me, are castigated because they must deal with the world as it is, while one hopes maintaining sights of the world which they aspire to achieve. At times, this delicate balancing act of idealism and pragmatism can lead to confusion and discontent. During my period of externally imposed isolation from the world, specifically in Sunyaburu, unlike my friend who is now in Qatar, <laughs> I devoured books from the classics of the Western canon to the great literature of Eastern civilization and everything else in between. There's nothing that we could find objectionable about that. However, sometimes I express the knowledge in ways that triggers the, in people the visceral reaction against a bad religion. For example, when I am talking about concepts of justice, humanity, or treachery to an, to an audience in Kuala Lumpur or Bangsa, you might hear me quoting from Shakespeare, Dickens, or Dante Alighieri. While I'm talking about the same subject matter of justice and humanity, but in a village in Kedah or Kelantan, I would instead draw from the Quran, classical Islamic scholarship, or even the prominent 19th century Malay scholar, Sheikh Dawood Abdullah al fatani Ideally, I should be able to say the same thing to everyone and they would understand. Pragmatically, we know that this cannot be the case. How does a teacher or a leader speak to his audience, but in the language that they most readily understand? What this indicates to me is that to everyone, stereotypes in all shapes and forms we must, as individuals and as a society, embrace a love of knowledge and never-ending learning. Consider the figure Sheikh Dawood I referred to earlier. A Malay scholar from, uh, born in 1720 in North Malaya, or the time we say south of Thailand, who studied throughout the Nusantara, especially in Aceh, lived in Makkah, for 30 years before returning to Fatani, South Thailand or North Peninsula at that time. And who is the author of many books that are highly revered by the Muslims of Malaysia and the region. Now, while I was in prison, I spent time reviewing his book, Munyatul Musalli, which is a standard text on how Muslims are uh, to perform their obligatory prayers. What is interesting to me about Munyatul Musalli, that book, however, is that the final chapter of the book is not about prayer, but about justice. A seminal introductory text about prayer which dedicates its final pages to the specific topic of justice stood out to me as unique. So I did what my any good student should do. I conducted further research and eventually published an essay in the journal Critical Muslim about the significance of the proximity of these two subject matters in Fatani's book, prayer and justice. Now, and to make a long story short, I'm speaking from scientists, it may sound as Greek to you as is to me when you talk about science. <laughs> now, it's clear that the author believes that the public manifestation of a life of a good prayer is the realization of justice in the world. Language is an issue in this country, which politicians to, tend to handle in a poor manner, be it teaching science in English or Bahasa Malay, 
speaking in broken Malay or good Chinese or teaching children in school to read in the script that's deep, dead and archive or listen to some of our ministers in international forums. Now the anger and confusion that resonates whenever these issues are raised is fundamentally a reflection of ignorance and the prevalence of stereotyping that must and can only be controlled by the interplay of knowledge and compassion or what we call wisdom, hikmah. Now to quote T.S. Eliot, where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? Where the life we have lost in living. As people of rational thought and scientific methods, I recognize that our country must overcome the stereotypes and misrepresentations which are not merely a product of an absence of knowledge. What I have been working for throughout my career is to foster a society of learning and love of knowledge and scholarship that leads us to a place where we can truly understand and appreciate one another. It makes me, it makes me proud that regular lectures such as this are taking place in Malaysia. And thanks to the Shaka Foundation, particularly to Winnie, who's chairman, for the chairperson. I know the challenge is how she has to give good advice to Vinod. <laughs> we should be particularly honored to be a part of the intellectual exchange endeavor named in honor of a great Malaysian without exaggeration, the late Dr. V.C. Sekar. He was a man who defied stereotypes. Be those the stereotypes of what one man can do, those against certain ethnicities and even what the world thinks of those of us from the region. He especially pushed the boundaries of our imagination on what a scientist can do. A nation that can produce a man like Dr. Seka should not presently find itself in such a dire condition. And especially with regards to science, research, technology, and development. What then has killed our endowment spirit? I know it is not the scientists, of course. If anything, the struggle for excellence has forced you to be more innovative and more resilient. Many things are just harder to do with here because of the obstacles you face. You, your creativity should not be wasted on jumping through the hoops the government places before you. A dismal and declining education system forces our great minds to go elsewhere, to further their skills and knowledge, conduct path-breaking research, and when appropriate, commercialize new technologies. This leaves us with the dearth of talent in Malaysia. We have a great we have great universities and institutions for higher education and training, and yet they live under the looming cloud of academic cowardice and the issue of toxic politicization of knowledge, not to mention incompetent and stifling bureaucracies. Inconsistent funding and the uncertainty of the government's whims likewise shackle our great minds. How can we be surprised, we lose them, to more accepting and fruitful climates for inspiration? Poor governance and management, vast sums of money lost to corruption, non-existent transparency and absent accountability only fortify these impediments. Our society has grown increasingly siloed in the recent decades. Scientists belong to their labs, civil servants to their offices. Everyone stays in their own camps. But this is not how society should work. The situation is quite complex when you begin to think about it. 
You all know we cannot solve complex problems with simple quick fixes. We need complex solutions to complex problems. We need to completely rethink our approaches to the issues we face as a nation, much as you all are forced to rethink a theory or a principle when a new result is observed or a new technology reveals a blind spot we were before ignorant of. This observation is at the heart of my plan and framework for building a better Malaysia, which I call Skit or Madani. With the permission of the my dear Winnie a person who would like to then to distribute to the audience, and you pay later. In the, <laughs> in the past, we have taken the ideas of others and simply copied and pasted them into the Malaysian context. This represents a flip where we begin at our shared values as Malaysians and then build upon build up upon them, rethinking conventional approaches and preparing ourselves for the fast unknowns all around us with our eyes fixed on the future. This process requires a few things. Firstly, I think we need a dose of humility. We must acknowledge that we may not have all the answers, but we, I mean ministers or senior civil servants, or researchers, to name a few. Therefore, this must be a society-wide endeavor. If we do not pool our knowledge and work with one another, we might as well wear blindfold or tie our hands behind our backs. I remember that precisely in the lockup. After that, I was badly assaulted. Let's be more, more cautious. And we must anticipate what might come next and be ready for the changes ahead, even breaking hair ahead and changing things ourselves. This is, after all, how you make the world a better place. These ideas are the heart of scientific exploration, Prof. In, com in composing the script framework, I choose to emphasize sustainability, care and compassion, Respect, innovation, prosperity, and trust. Not because there are buzzwords in vogue in current discussions about development in education or innovation. I chose them because we need to look at them in our context, for within them lies a blending of our multicultural values that we can see regardless of our diverse backgrounds. More importantly, it is because within each of these values lies all the others and they must all be considered working in a synthesis to restore Malaysia in a place that produces more Dr. B.C. Sekas. If you want a sustainable Malaysia, that requires care and compassion for others. Dr. Sekas revolutionized the rubber and palm oil industries in this nation. But he also cared for the workers and saw their needs and the needs of their family. He respected all the people he worked with, Malays, Chinese, Indians, and the rest. The need for innovation goes within, without saying, uh, for something to be sustained, it must change, adapt. Prosperity is what we all look for. But this is not merely measured in ringgit, but in comfort, living in advanced Malaysia, in safety, in securing our children's futures. And the backbone, the crux of which this all stands, is trust. There is, of course, a trust deficit in this country. Dr. Seko, on the contrary, built trust among all the moving parts of the industries he worked in and with the government. We face a deficit of trust today with the notion of post-truth. We cannot trust experts. We certainly cannot trust politicians, excepting a few. <laughs> so, who can we trust? Perhaps we can begin by trusting in each other. 
And bear in mind that trust cannot be asked for, but it must be earned through action. So I come to you all here, esteemed scientists, thinkers, academicians, friends. Critical is that this is not just for me, but this is for all, all of us. In script, it's not a guidebook with all the answers to the complicated problems. Again, I reiterate, this is a framework for enabling our ability to work in our contemporary and chaotic world and find solutions together. This is a living document that requires input, criticism, responses from all, including you. Much of the policy and changes I propose are deeply rooted to science and technology, which will be essential towards advancing our nation and confronting some of our big challenges, including education reform, climate change, and better health care. Stereotypes say we are an agricultural society, can only get um, to a certain level. But we have shown this is not true. With a government that can provide the right environment, we can show them again. Not only will a uh, government that I lead, inshallah, on the 20th, provide the funding and facilities you need, but it will make sure that our universities and schools are better equipped and held to higher standards to nurture our great minds of the future and keep them from migrating to other lands for better opportunities. And your work, your tireless research, I will not allow to be for nothing. While we all produce more papers and more patients, more importantly, the work and innovation of our scientific and research community must translate into improvements in the lives of everyday Malaysians and people around the world. I am dedicated to ensuring your work's challenges and stereotypes thrust upon our nation. Your work will feed our people in sustainable and environmentally complementary ways. We therefore can see the revolution in our agricultural industries and set new global standards for diversity. Before I conclude, I must take a moment to talk about the elephant in the room, which is that parliament has been dissolved. <laughs> the 15th general elections is scheduled for November 19th, and I am in the midst of campaign season yet again. <laughs> Some of you have been following the ups and downs and the slings and arrows of Malaysian politics for some time. Some of you may be gearing up for the election and others may thoroughly be disillusioned with the state of affairs. To quote Shakespeare, since I am again in one of these liberal audiences, something is rotten in the state. I would say to all of you, it matters deeply to me that all Malaysians take the time to understand the issues at stake and make the effort to cast their balance. When Pakatan Harapan achieved the impossible in the last general elections, there were tremendous euphoria about the potential for Malaysia to finally move away from authoritarianism, authoritarianism corruption uh -huh. and end corruption towards democracy, transparency and accountability. For me, it was essential that Malaysia, a multicultural, multi-religious society, achieve this democratic transformation peacefully without shedding a single drop of blood. This would be consequential for the entire world. More importantly is that we could get on with the business of nation building so that all our people feel that they and their children have the chance
to thrive in this prosperous nation. The euphoria gave way to the uh, uh, first to confusion and disappointment and eventually to sheer odium and repulsion. To this I say two things. <clears throat> Firstly, as you all know, the process of change or of discovery, of mastery is not always linear. We are on a zigzag path in which setbacks, obstacles and occasional failures is to be expected. But we cannot give up when the going gets tough. Secondly, I would say to you that the importance of getting this right for Malaysians and for the world cannot be overstated. Around the world we see fascism, xenophobia, Islamophobia and other jingoism are continuing to grow. Strong roots in supposedly enlightened societies. In Malaysia, we have a real chance to get things on the right track. And I believe we can and must succeed. For us to move forward, we need you and all your colleagues, friends and family to do their civic duty, to do their civic duty on November the 19th. I'm honored finally to be amongst you, much um, as I am honored to be sharing the memory of a great Malaysian, Dr. B.C. Seka. And thank you, Dr. Ganesh Kisho, for continuing to provide us the, and fostering a resilient, sustainable supply chain and increased nutritional security. I'll see how you eat tonight. <laughs> So, sekali lagi terima kasih Bino, terima kasih Winnie and all the friends, Anna dan Mansor. Assalamualaikum.